What an exciting evening, and I myself am very honoured to be part of this historic gathering of internet leaders and innovators. In 2012, the Internet Society founded the Internet Hall of Fame as a recognition programme that honours pioneers, leaders and visionaries who have made significant contributions to the advancement and expansion of the global internet. It has evolved into a virtual museum that celebrates the living history of the internet and the individuals whose extraordinary contributions have made the internet its worldwide availability and use and its transformative nature possible. To open today's ceremony, I'd like to introduce Bob Hinden, Chair of the Internet Society Board of Trustees, and ask him to come on stage. Um, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. This is my second trip to Hong Kong, and this was even nicer than my first trip. I've always liked this city a lot. Um, so I wanted to thank you for joining us. It's a, it's a very honor to be here for this historic occasion. Um, and it's a very pleasure for me and for the society to be here in Hong Kong. I'd like to thank the Hong Kong government for their warm hospitality and support for the 2014 Internet Hall of Fame, um, which is being co-located with the International IT Fest. So it's um, very, very good to be here this time. Um, from the Hong Kong government, I'd like to thank our special guests, the Honorable J John Jung, the Mr. Daniel Lee, and Ms. Joey Lam. So thank you very much. Uh, also special thanks to the meetings and exhibitions Hong Kong for their tremendous support for making this event possible. I would also like to extend uh, our appreciation to the Internet Society Hong Kong chapter as our host, and particular thanks to Chester Soon, the chairman of the Hong, ISOC Hong Kong chapter, not only for your excellent support here, but for the work of the Hong Kong chapter for advocating for a free and open Internet. The Internet Society has more than 100 chapters around the world, and the Hong Kong chapter, which is was established in 2005 is one of our most active. It's, uh, I think it's really a model for uh, many of our other chapters. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Charles Mock. He's the founding chair of the Internet Society of Hong Kong and is now the legislative counselor for IT. Um, and also welcome all the special guests of the Internet Society Hong Kong chapter. So on behalf of the Internet Society Board of Trustees, we're very proud to support the Internet Hall of Fame and its recognition for the remarkable individuals who helped to shape and extend the global reach of the Internet. And I'd particularly like to recognize the ISOC Board of Trustees are here. We had our board meeting here just com concluded uh, earlier today. Could you all stand up? I know you're here. Good. Thank you. Yeah, we, we really like having our meetings at where there are interesting internet-related events um, going on. It's much better than just going to a hotel and staying there for a couple days and then leaving. We, we like to sort of participate in events like this. Um, the Internet Society believes the internet is for everyone and the, fu and the future of the open global internet is extremely important to us. Um, the 24 pioneers, innovators, and connectors we are rec recognizing today were willing to take risks to make bold achievements in technology and to pursue their work no matter what the challenges or consequences, and we were, great for, we were very grateful for their contributions. I, I would add to this that um, when the Internet was, or the things that led to the Internet were being developed, it was not the popular thing. It was, in fact, the opposite. It was, um, it was the underdog. And it may have been successful because of that, because um, governments and others and commercial entities hadn't quite noticed it yet. So it was a, actually a very major accomplishment by the people who helped develop the pieces of the internet because of this. It, was, you know, it wasn't the thing that everyone else in the world was was for. So it's, it's, I think, an even 
bigger achievement than we tend to remember. So I'll now turn um, the program over to the Internet Society President and CEO, Kathy Brown. Hello, everyone. You all look very beautiful tonight and very handsome. Thank you for being here, one and all. Thank you, all the guests we have, for uh, joining us uh, today. I'm, um, I'm quite um, impressed with all the jackets and ties on our technology folks. So, <laughs> This year's uh, inductees, are, they compromise a, a diverse group of some of the world's most influential engineers, trailblazers, innovators, and thought leaders representing many different countries and backgrounds, each with an inspiring story to tell. And I hope you've had an opportunity to actually read about um, how these folks change the world. Together, they've given the internet its global reach, uh, contributed to and upheld its ideals of open standards, and helped to make it accessible to people around the globe. We, we really, truly have all benefited from your work, and um, we take time to say thank you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge uh, several important partners uh, in the Internet Hall of Fame. First, our sponsors, Affilius, has been a longtime partner of the Internet Society. And I know Ram is here somewhere. We are extremely grateful for their continued support. And uh, Telescenaria uh, International Carrier is a new sponsor for us uh, for the Internet Hall of Fame, and so we thank you also for your support. I'd also like to recognize the Internet Hall of Fame Advisory Board for their work, important work, in selecting the 2014 inductees. Uh, their names are uh, behind me. The uh, Advisory Board is an international committee that spans multiple Internet segments and backgrounds. Um, as I said, here they are, but we have two with us today, my friend Raul uh, Echeverria, where are you, Raul? And um, Andrew Vu, who takes pictures of everyone, too. Uh, they are both here with us today. We're honored to have several of our Internet Hall of Fame members here, too. Uh, Dave Farber was uh, actually one of my mentors, brought me along, uh, taught me what the Internet is, and I'm always, always pleased to be in the same place as he is. And there he is over there. Uh, and Randy Bush, who I've only just uh, met, but who makes an impression on anybody he ever meets, uh, from the 2012 class, two of our inductees. You will all have that pleasure next year when I hope you come. Uh, thank you to all our partners that help make the Internet Hall of Fame possible. And thanks uh, to all of you for uh, being here for this special occasion. So, we're on. Now I want to take this opportunity to introduce our guest of honor, the Honorable John Dung, Financial Secretary of the HKSAR Government. Uh, Kathy, Bob, Charles, uh, Chester, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm really pleased to join you all for the 2014 Internet Hall of Fame induction ceremony today. I'm delighted that Hong Kong is the first city in the Asia Pacific region to host this prestigious event for the global internet community. A warm welcome to you all, especially to our guests who have uh, come from around the world. The Internet Hall of Fame celebrates pioneers of a technology which has transformed the way that we live, we work, and the way that we learn. With an extensive range of information resources and services, the internet has made our world more productive, more efficient, as well as more convenient. It promotes knowledge sharing and global connectivity. The internet also opens up seemingly endless possibilities for the future. Hong Kong people have embraced the internet age as an integral and indispensable feature of our generation. With a robust telecommunications infrastructure, Hong Kong's broadband and mobile penetration rates are among the highest in the world. 
More than 80% of our households in Hong Kong have broadband, and our mobile penetration rate is a whooping 238%. Over 70% of our mobile phone subscribers use smartphones to gain access to the internet while on the go. Using the internet for shopping, banking, organizing our leisure time, and connecting with friends has become second nature to us. In today's era of cloud computing, together with the development of the Internet of Things, new applications will continue to emerge and the Internet will become even more ubiquitous. To take full advantage of the Internet, it is important for Hong Kong to maintain an open, free and secure information environment. The government is committed to safeguarding freedom of information, ensuring cybersecurity, and enhancing accessibility to the internet. I shall elaborate a little bit on each one of those points. First, freedom of information. The internet offers unprecedented opportunity to express ideas and to receive information. Freedom of speech and expression are actually guaranteed by the basic law, which is our constitution in Hong Kong. And this includes a free media and uncensored internet. While the internet is a powerful tool, it can also be exploited to infringe on people's right to privacy. A responsible approach is required by individuals as well as by governments. In Hong Kong, we have a sound legal system. We take great pride in upholding the rule of law and protecting the freedom that we cherish. Except for selected law enforcement purposes, internet service providers uphold confidentiality of user data, helping to foster a healthy and open environment for the internet community. My second point is cybersecurity. Hong Kong government has put in place an IT security management framework to protect our critical internet infrastructure against cyber attack. The Hong Kong Computer Emergency Response Team Coordination Center collaborates with global information security organizations to gather security intelligence and provide advice on measures to counter security threats and prevent cyber attacks. We also promote information security awareness among the community at large. We are committed to continuing with our work on these fronts to ensure a safe and trustworthy environment for internet users. Third, enhancing accessibility. The internet belongs to everyone. To facilitate access to online information and services, we have been implementing the Web Accessibility Campaign since 2011. The campaign encourages good barrier-free website designs that are accessible to everyone. Government websites conform to World Wide Web Consortium Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Level AA. To encourage the private sector to follow suit, we organize training and we provide relevant resources. We have also launched a Web Accessibility Recognition Award to salute organizations and enterprises which adopt web accessibility designs in their websites. So ladies and gentlemen, the potential of the internet and its convergence with other emerging technologies are enormous. Today we pay tribute to those who have paved the way for internet development as pioneers, as innovators, and global connectors. I congratulate all the new inductees into the Internet Hall of Fame. And finally, I would like to thank the Internet Society and the Internet Society Hong Kong chapter for staging this event, which is a highlight of the International IT Fest 2014. I wish you all an enjoyable time and our visitors a memorable stay with us here in Hong Kong. Just remember one thing, shop a lot. Thank you. <laughs>
also the um, Internet Hall of Fame Committee to allow ISO Hong Kong chapter to be the local host of such magnificent um, event of the Internet community. It is only our privilege and honor to have such an event uh, being hosted in Hong Kong. When you hear thank you notes and or speeches um, for Oscars or similar, you know, our ceremonies, people usually start by saying, you know, thank you to so and so, you know, uh, with, uh, without these people, the making of such movie would not be possible, blah, blah, blah. And I would like to say exactly that tonight. <laughs> well, of course, we're not making movie, right? But although these Hall of Famers still um, do not represent the thousands and thousands of people who work um, so hard to have created and to operate the internet, without these in, uh, internet visionaries, innovators, and entrepreneurs, um, for whom we have here, the internet might not be here. These people did not just make a website that hit one, you know, uh, one million users, you know, first month, or created an app that, you know, have ten hundred thousands of downloads in 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 few days. These people um, invented technologies and that formed and shaped the internet where it is today. Both of you know who founded Facebook, Amazon, WhatsApp, and probably know, you know, know how much their net worths are you know, when, they, when they sell their companies, right? But you may not actually know who um, created the computer mouse, World Wide Web, IP routing, um, SAML, and you know, the open platform of you know, Linux where a lot of our internet platforms, you know, operating are operating on today. Um, so as a, as a, this, and the technologies and software that these people created or invented have affected the way internet exists, the way it is used, um, and even how it will be changed in the future. So as a member of the internet community. Um, this is my most honorable moment to be part of the Internet Hall of Fame 2014 and welcome these extraordinary individuals in person to Hong Kong. Thank you. Now, the big moment for the awards. We will announce our 2014 inductees, and when your name is announced, we'll ask you to come up to the stage and make a few brief remarks. We have a sample of the award here on the table for you to see, which is a medallion encased in a shadow box. For ease of transporting, we will ship your award to your home in the next several weeks. Today, when you come up on stage, Cathy Brown will hand you a leather portfolio and certificate as a keepsake from this event. So let's begin with the inductees, starting with the innovators. Innovators category, recognizing individuals who made outstanding technological, commercial, or policy advances and helped to expand the internet's reach. Eric Allman. Created Deliver Mail for the ARPANET and SendMail, one of the first mail transfer agents on the internet. Let's welcome, let's welcome him. Uh, hello. Um, I have managed to live an extraordinarily lucky lifetime. Um, one of my first strokes of luck was happening to arrive at UC Berkeley the same year that uh, Unix did, 1973, and so I got in on the ground floor there. And there were some extraordinary people at Berkeley as well, which made Berkeley Unix into uh, something that was closely tied to the growth of the internet. When I started, of course, there was no capital I internet. Um, there were, however, uh, eventually a bunch of smaller networks that didn't talk to each other. and. I decided that they needed to talk to each other, at least for email. And we had ARPANET, we had something called BerkNet, we had UUCP, and later PurdueNet, and CSNet, and so forth. And so that was the lowercase i internet. That's what uh, John Quarterman calls the matrix. And that was deliver mail. That was to make those things work together. Uh, Bill Joy was uh, one of the principals on the Berkeley Unix version that had the first TCP IP stack, and he needed somebody to 
write the mail server. And uh, somehow he convinced me to do this, which uh, if I had realized at the time, I never would have done it, but that's true of many things. Um, so that was the uh, conversion from deliver mail to send mail. The goal of send mail was still to try and unify things, pull things together, and not necessarily to do everything, um, which many systems these days apparently feel they need to re-implement absolutely everything, which seems wasteful to me. Uh, I also ended up working on something called syslog, which is the basic system logging facility. I did that as part of the SendMail project, but intentionally to be generic. And that, in some sense, has been more successful than SendMail, even though nobody seems to know that I wrote it. Uh, it's in pretty much every printer, wireless access point, you name it, it's, it's just there. And uh, so I'm actually quite proud of that, even if I am anonymous on that side. Um, there are, of course, way too many people to thank, so I'm not going to try and thank all of them, but I'm going to call out just a couple of names. Um, Bill Joy, of course, who, if he hadn't talked me into this, it, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, Michael Stonebreaker and Susan Graham, who uh, were both at various times employing me to do something else, and yet still managed to allow me to work on SendMail. Um, Brian Costales, who literally wrote the book on SendMail and uh, made it much more popular. Documentation is important, I'm here to tell you. And finally, my husband, Marshall Kirk McCusick, who uh, supported me through a lot of this thing, including all the times I spent way more time with my computer than I did with him. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the second one, Eric Biener, who co-created the first widely used browser, Mosaic, and co-founded Netscape. Eric was not able to join us today, but we will accept this award on his behalf. Okay. Next we have Karl Heinz Brandenburg, the driving force behind some of today's most innovative digital audio technology, notably MP3 and the MPEG audio standards. Let's welcome Karl Heinz Brandenburg. So, thank you very much. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing here, but Okay, that's a usual speech, but I have to do it. I'm standing here for a number of others. Like it's usual in science, of course, standing on the shoulders of others. There was a lot of other work. But there were a lot of other people involved in that. Uh, MP3 is the nickname today used for MPEG Audio Layer 3. And that's a standard issued by the... ISO, IAC subgroup called MPEG, Moving Pictures Experts Group. So you know that, and you know that there are lots of people who have a say of what the standard will be. But before becoming a standard, of course, there was technology to be built. So I have to thank my former bosses, uh, Professor Seitze, who in the 70s had the idea that it should be possible to send audio over phone lines, over ISDN. And at that time, he was um, told by a patent examiner, no, no, according to the state of the arts, this is impossible. <laughs> so he tried and had to find a PhD student who would try, and luckily, I was around. And Professor Gerhäuser, who later led the group at Fraunhofer to do all this work, the chairs of the standards group, Leonardo Chiraglione, the convener of MPEG, Professor Moosman and Professor Noll later on, who chaired the audio group. But that's just the formal part. There's a lot of people's ideas in there. And yes, there's somebody in the US who had very similar ideas. He did his patent application a little bit too late. <laughs> Uh, but otherwise, uh, we worked together then, in fact. That's Jim Johnston of AT&T Bell Labs at that time. And he gets to be blamed for some of these ideas as well. 
And there's a whole group in Erlangen. Bernhard Grill, Jürgen Herre, Ernst Eberlein, Thomas Sporer, Harold Popp. You see, I read, so I don't forget too many of them, but there were more. We had at some point a real team of people working together in all aspects. We had people from other companies helping us a lot, like Band Edler from Hanover and so on. But that's only one part to be able to develop such a technology, to do all the politics in the standards group, which wasn't easy. And then, in most people's minds, to be the second ones. Technology which was leading technology-wise, but too complicated to be used right away. Uh, so we had a difficult start time. So the thank goes to everybody who helped to spread the technology. OK, no, there's one guy I won't thank. And that's the one who used the stolen credit card number to buy our software and then spread it, claiming it's free. <laughs> he did help us, but still, I don't thank him. But I thank everybody who believed in the technology. We had our friends, and in the end, MP3 really helped to change the internet by making music available. Uh, by some means, people didn't like, especially the music labels didn't like. And I have to say always, no, I think musicians and labels should be paid for their work. Uh, but there was really a grassroots movement of people who liked the technology and spread it. And I have to thank all these. MP3 is really a sex success of the internet as well. Not just that we used uh, the emerging ideas of writing frequently asked questions on net news or uh, spreading shareware software in the early days. All that helped. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to the Internet Society, to select this technology. And that's it. Next, we have John Choffey, known as the father of DSL. Please welcome John Choffey. Um, well, first, let me begin by thanking the Internet Society for uh, selecting me. It's truly a great honor to be inducted here into your Internet a Hall of Fame. In viewing the list of uh, previous and current inductees, one is awestruck by the uh, just to be included among them. Uh, my own contributions in broadband access, particularly DSL, seem somewhat dwarfed by those of the others, and I thank the hall profusely for including me. Um, the, uh, but uh, nonetheless, DSL is used on a half a billion uh, phone lines around the world, and I, I look forward to seeing uh, billions of bits per second go to uh, billions of people uh, over the next decade. Um, as with everyone, there are many other people who have contributed to this, uh, this area that I'd like to thank. Um, uh, first, let me start with uh, Stanford University, who was my employer for about two decades and where much of the early work was done. And in particular, all the many students there who participated in this, in the developments of, of DSL, they really did all the work. And not the least of, of which were some of those who joined me at a small company called Amadi, which pioneered the uh, original DSL designs in the early 1990s, early 1990s, including Peter Chow, Jackie Chow, uh, Jim Aslanis, Krista Jacobson, along with professionals from the industry, Mark Flowers, Mark Mallory, and John Bingham. Also, thanks to Texas Instruments, who purchased uh, Amadi after it had gone public with the basic DSL chips, and uh, they promoted that area, and uh, for several years thereafter, were the largest supplier of DSL components uh, in the world. Uh, further, uh, great thanks goes to my current employer, Asia Inc., which has been a true pioneer in advancing DSL and Wi-Fi software definition and management of access networks for many more former Stanford students have joined me. Uh, a list uh, here, Wong John Lee, Iker Almendaz, George Jenis, Mehdi Musini, Artivan Maleki, Phil Bednars, Mark Goldberg, uh, Cheng Yu Chen, Ming Yan Chen, Bin Li, Wu Yu Li, Phil Abbott, Chan Tzu Wang, Mohammed Karafuddin, and Tosin Alutsen have made tremendous contributions, as well as engineering professionals there also, uh, Peter Silverman, Manny Balakrishnan, 
Arasahidi, Sina Kalegi, and Ming Shen Huang. Uh, George, uh, Jeff Moyer, uh, Ken Kerpez, Stefano Galli, and Kamal Yasin. And also to the rest of the very supportive staff and professional uh, business people there at, at Arasi. And finally, and especially to our company's namesake and my wife and co-founder of the company, Asia, who's here with me tonight for a continued source of inspiration and support. She's sitting right over there. So thank you very much. Next, we have Hua Lin Tian led completion of the initial internet connection in China and the construction of China's top level domain. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have much to say because I haven't done much. I want to express my thanks to, to the Internet Society for organizing this in the Internet Hall of Fame program. And also want to express my thanks to my colleagues working together with me for many, many years. Lastly, I want to express my thanks to the Internet pioneers who invented the Internet. This is not only beneficial to the people around the world, especially in China. There are more than 600 million people using internet every day. But also, it's very beneficial to me. For me, they created the job opportunities to get rid of unemployment. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have Paul Vixi, who designed and deployed several domain name system protocol extensions and applications that are used throughout the internet today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I spent the first half, let's say 15 years of a career trying to make communications easier. Um, because I could tell that something like the internet could become humanity's collective digital nervous system. And I thought that was a cool thing. I thought that would be great. I've spent roughly the second half, another 15 years, trying to make communication harder, or at least more selective and safer, because of all of the criminals and spammers that we brought with us when we created humanity's collective digital nervous system. <laughs> Um, I stand here, as was mentioned, on the shoulders of giants, um, at least a dozen of whom I see in the audience before me. Um, I went around uh, when I realized that uh, success was inevitable. Uh, sometime in the last 10 years, I went around and I said, how can I thank you guys? And um, they said, pay it forward. That's what we did. And so that's what I'm doing. Thank you all for inviting me and for this award. Now we will move on to our next category, which is Global Connectors, recognizing individuals from around the world who have made significant contributions to the global growth and use of the internet. Firstly, we have Di Davis, who introduced internet technology into the pan-European backbone EuropaNet. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great honor and a privilege to stand here and address you. It is a really remarkable looking back over 23 years working in the internet environment. When I started in 1991, I was a hired gun. I was brought in. Uh, to create a network, a pan-European network, and I was going to do it for three years. 23 years later, I'm still involved in the same thing. What actually happened was it wasn't just a project. We created an organization. That organization is Dante, and Dante has been responsible for six generations of pan-European research internet. 
And we moved from 64 kilobits technology to 100 gigabits technology in that period of time. I would particularly like to mention Howard Davis, who was co-general manager of me and founding general manager of Dante, and the Dante team. And also, I think it's important to put it in a funding context as well, because the European Commission has given us tremendous support in terms of developing both the European footprint and making internet technology available, both from a research perspective, but also to support researchers in other disciplines. Finally, I look back at the very freewheeling spirit of development, which is really what the internet is all about. And I think it is vital to preserve that very open development environment, which the academic community has helped so much to contribute. Corporatism has a place in the internet, but ultimately it's about individuals and individual creativity. And that spirit, which was there 23 years ago, is still there today and is what we must preserve. Thank you. Thank you. Demi Getchko, key player in establishing the first internet connection to Brazil and member of Brazilian Internet Steering Committee since its creation. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what can I say? First of all, uh, thank you very much to Isaac and, uh, <coughs> and the sponsors of this magnificent event. It, it's uh, it's an honor for me to be here. It's an undeserved honor for me. But I'm proud to be a, a thin bit of this uh, construction, this marvelous construction that Internet is and, and keep being. Uh, uh, we we uh, began this in the 80s in Brazil, uh, began to connect academic networking and so. I am part of the a big team that worked on that. I will not try to remember all the names, but I can remember Professor Oscar Sala, maybe remember also Tadao Takahashi, uh, Ivan Mora Campos, uh, Alberto Gomidi, Michael Stanton, and many others that will not uh, <laughs> cite their names right now, but really, really important on this effort. And we, we, we saw that the internet faced a lot of threats from the very beginning, the battle from protocols, uh, how we can evolve uh, the, the TCPIP under the pressure of the, the current uh, uh, CCITT protocols for networking. Uh, the, the, I, saw, I think that the problem was the same in many countries. And we, we see uh, internet embracing uh, billions of new users without losing its uh, characteristics of openness, of, of voluntary contribution, and freedom. And we hope that we we'll keep the, it, it in this, this way. I finish with the well-known phrase of the late Postel that we are living very interesting times and keep living these this interesting times. Thank you very much. Next, we have Masaki Hirabaru. Instrumental role in the formation of the Japan Network Information Center and proposed creation of the Asia Pacific Network Information Center. This is a posthumous award. Accepting the award on his behalf is his daughter, Mika Hira Baru. I'm Masaki's daughter, Mika Hira Baru. I'm very happy that I came up that I could participate in this ceremony today for my father. To be honest, I grew up without knowing much of his work, but this time I could know that there were many people who regarded how he regarded his work and loved his character. It's been five years since he passed away, but this induction gave me a chance to no, the other side of him. I am very proud of him and I really miss him. I want to say thank you to all people who came and regarded my father's work and especially Mr. Maimura and Mr. Fujisaki to support me today. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Eric Hauser, first author of the first request for comments to document not only the Internet Engineering Task Force standards process, but also the procedures of working groups. Thank you, Eric Hauser. Uh, well, I never thought I'd stand here um, and, and then have to, to say a thank you word uh, in the same way that the Oscar winners do. Um, uh, I will thank my mother, but I'll do that a little bit later. Um, <laughs> I, I learned today uh, a couple of things. I'm a music lover and I, I learned two things today. One is uh, immediately when the news was announced on Twitter, somebody said to me, do you know that Will I Am has a number that is called Hall of Fame? So that's, uh, uh, that's something we should try and, and uh, listen to tonight. Uh, the other one, of course, is that I finally got the meaning of uh, the Oasis number uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, because uh, as has been said before, that's how I feel I am here. It was 1987, uh, I had just finished my PhD during which I had implemented the IP protocol on some PCs and uh, my boss, uh, whom I own, uh, to whom I own very much, Case Nagers at that time, Case, by the way, is also uh, an inductee in the Hall of Fame, he sent me off to an internet meeting in Boston and I arrived in Boston in a hotel uh, checked in, came downstairs and feared, what shall I do for dinner? And there I run into Vin Cerf, who didn't know me, of course, but I knew him. And, and I, so I, I boldly introduced myself and Vin said, hey, you want to come to dinner? And I said, well, yes, please. So he shoved me into a, a cab and I turned around and I was sitting um, besides uh, John Postel, Steve Crocker, and in front was Vin Cerf. <laughs> the rest, as they say, is history. Um, so, then let me start by thanking a couple of people, um, first of all my parents without whom I wouldn't be here, um, and, and they always uh, inspired me to, to think independently and I think that's um, one of the main things you can teach your children. Um, uh, of course my family, I've been away a lot and uh, they've always put up with that. Um, my children never understood what I'm doing. They still don't under understand what I'm doing here, but one of my daughters remarked, great that you go to Hong Kong, you can buy me a fake Gucci bag. <laughs> and my employers, NOB, TNO, gave me all the uh, freedom to do whatever I needed to do. Uh, but most of all, SurfNet. I, w I used to work there from 2000 to 2012. I came back two years ago as CTO, and this is a company that always has uh, worked to build a part of an open, trustworthy, and accessible internet. And that is exactly what I think I've been doing uh, over the last 30 years, helping to create that open, trustworthy, and accessible internet. Uh, I met many fantastic, motivated, uh, driven, and especially fun people in the process, a lot of whom are in this room. And uh, it, it really inspired me to work even harder on this. And um, I really um, thank you all uh, for being here and being my colleagues and working with me. And last thing I want to say is that mid last year, I got incredibly angry when I realized that I'd been building this open, trustworthy and accessible internet. Well, that's what I thought. And that governments have started misusing this same internet to spy on their own civilians. This is not what we build the internet for. So please, Let's continue our work and make sure that governments don't misuse it in this way. Thank you. Stephen Huter, 
As head of the Network Startup Resource Center, he's worked in more than 100 countries to help build internet infrastructure. Thank you to the Internet Society and to the Hong Kong ISOC chapter for hosting this event and to those who nominated me for this honor today. Uh, I gratefully accept it as director and leader of the NSR's Network Startup Resource Center, though I think this nomination should rightfully go to the group as a body, uh, the body as a group uh, of NSRC, recognizing many others that have contributed to, to this work. I came along in the, in the early 1990s to join the internet development community at a time when you know, this work was cultivated by a mix of academia, government, and industry, and it was really starting to flourish. And the growth of the net was starting to explode at that point with two to three new countries joining you know, every, every month or two with their first full TCP IP connections. Um, I met Randy Bush in Portland, Oregon in 1993, where he was connecting a number of countries around the world using FidoNet, UCPs, di intermittent dial-up IP links, satellite IP links, all kinds of stepping stone arrangements that connected Peru, South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Belize, Lebanon, Guinea, Saudi Arabia, all were connecting through Oregon, through this work Randy had been doing, and, and others that were really designed to help computer scientists and network engineers in those countries provide internet access and services uh, to their communities. So I was really intrigued by, by the work of the NSRC, and one of my first assignments was to do a global survey of the various connections and the types that existed in Asia, uh, Pacific, Latin America, Caribbean, Africa, and the Middle East uh, to try and uh, inform the United States National Science Foundation where new links were emerging and possibly new uh, could be useful for international science and educational collaborations. And there were also lots of NGOs uh, around at this time that were among the first user communities uh, taking advantage of internet communications to enhance their work on health, education, uh, economic development, human rights advocacy. And we always try to team up with these, with these groups, these orgs, to, so they could use you know, the internet to uh, enhance their work more effectively. Um, what inspires me the most, I think, about you know, the work that I do and what I enjoy most about the work that I do is the people. Um, I've been so fortunate to work with literally thousands of, of amazing people in you know, more than 100 countries from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. And uh, I think you know, the social engineering that's required for starting new networks and is a really important aspect of the internet development and it's often how these things get started. And, uh, you know, and then ultimately to build sustainable networks, you've got to have local hands cultivating local expertise. Hence our effort on so much training and capacity building with many of the people in this room in various places around the world. But I think I'm, I'm always happiest, you know, when we've completed some challenging work in the field, the networks are happily moving more IP packets to more people, and then my friends in the, the country, you know, invite me and the NSRC team to their homes for dinner. And, you know, we meet their families and uh, enjoy some fun times together. And those are the, the really meaningful memories that I cherish in, in this work. Um, open architecture networking is really what makes the internet the internet, and every new node on the net has the potential to be a peer. And I mean that in the physical sense of peering and exchanging data and content, but more importantly in the human sense of being your peer, your collaborator, your friend, and, and it's important that we respect all nodes and all people who are part of the internet community system. Who knows where the next big thing on the net will come from? Um, thanks to my family, to my colleagues at University of Oregon, and to all who support me and the NSRC in our internet development ventures to light up more places and connect more places around the world. Thank you. Abaya Endura, a pioneered academic and research networking and internet deployment in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, fellow inductees, uh, my family, especially my granddaughter Kiara, who is with us, and also 
uh, my friends here. Imagine a world before the World Wide Web. Imagine a time before uh, you had smartphones. And imagine a life where you'd have, you had to live with X25. And uh, this was the time I was dreaming of a research academic network for Sri Lankan academic community. Um, it was in 1983, the Vice Chancellor of University of Muratua, Professor Billy Mendes, asked me to set up a department to teach computing. And at that time, I came from electrical engineering, so I, I've been teaching Fortran, but not computing or computing science. So I looked around and found that there were courses in Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia at that time. So I came to Hong Kong in 1984. And I visited the Hong Kong University, uh, studied their curriculum. And that was the first time I got a taste of research and academic networking. It was fascinating to see, even in 1984, with all the non-standard disparate technologies, they were somehow exchanging information. And in 1989, I proposed to the Sri Lankan government the setting up of what I call LEARN, Lanka Experimental Academic and Research Network. You can imagine being a developing country, funds are not easy to come by. So in 1990, with very limited resources I had, we launched Learn Mail, the first IP-based email for academics and researchers in the country. Initially, of course, Steve missed Sri Lanka in the list. Uh, Randy was always helping us to connect to UCP. So we were sending mail by IDD, which was very expensive at the time, connecting three times a week. Now, of course, the volume exploded. And within a few months, we were connecting three times a day. And because it was expensive, um, we had to seek support. And I must mention the support we got from the Computer and Information Technology Council of Sri Lanka. At the time, I was an inaugural board member, so I was able to twist their arms, get some funds. The University Grants Commission of Sri Lanka, and also the LUCNET, a not-for-profit organization set up in the US to support new ICT endeavors in Sri Lanka. In 1992, I reformulated the proposal and submitted to the government again, but this time calling Learn Internet. Now X25 was gone, and I was happy. And uh, that time I was lucky. The government was happy to provide 3 million Sri Lankan rupees, about 30,000, 40,000 US dollars at the time. And we were able to buy routers and 364 kilobits per second wireless links. And again, um, I should mention here the uh, developing country workshops organized, by, organized and funded by the Internet Society. That's where I met great people like Randy and George Sadowski, and I came to about Steve, and uh, with people like Ben Siegel helping us. Um, we were able to set up the first IP van in Sri Lanka, connecting my university, University of Muratua, to the University of Colombo and the Open University. And the rest, as they say, is history. So I'm standing here today, uh, certainly not uh, because of only my effort. It was celebrating this collective effort that we put in. So I am not going to mention names, but at least I should mention the brilliant students I had. Uh, most of them are professionals on their own rights today. Uh, Professor Gihan Das, uh, Professor Lalit Kamage, uh, Professor Nimal Ratnayaka, they were all helping me at that time to set it up. And uh, I'm very glad that country has benefited. I've been able to make a significant impact on socio-economic development in that country. And I'm very delighted to be here today. I'm deeply honored to be part of this celebration. Thank you, Internet Society, and thank you very much.
Dorcas Mithoni, founder of a mentorship and capacity building initiative for women in computing across Africa. She was not able to join us, but she sent a representative to accept the award. The award will be accepted by Irene Misoy. I'm greatly honored to be in your midst. I will receive the award on behalf of uh, Dr. Smudoni, who could not uh, be here with us. She just had a small baby about a month ago. So um, a Linux Chicks member added on to, uh, uh, to the community. I'll read a small speech from her. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored uh, with this award. I'm really excited that um, I won it and want to thank you for supporting me and trusting my professional qualities. Your support means a lot to me. It is a recognition of my hard work during more than 20 years. Today, I'm an entrepreneur and a mentor, and I believe that I have followed my vocation since my early years, I was sure the information technology would really bring the world together through the internet. My story of success started many years back when I started by helping uh, build networks for universities, being among the first women uh, engineers to work with the Kenya Educational Network, which is the NREN for Kenya, Kenyan institutions of higher learning, which has grown over the years, and later started up uh, an open source uh, company called Open World that develops uh, software, open source software for uh, e-governments. And in 2004, founded an organization called AFCHIX Africa, a technical uh, capacity building initiative for women in the region. For over five years in Kenya and across other African countries, AFCHIC's activities have included organizing annual computing career uh, conferences uh, with a special emphasis on encouraging uh, the uptake of computing careers amongst young women and high school girls. This is one of uh, my greatest passion. We have trained many women in Linux uh, system administration from many African countries that have uh, AFTIC uh, chapters, who in turn have become trainers and trained other women in their countries. We started a mentorship program a career workshop for girls in high school. This involved bringing together uh, girls from secondary schools all over the country in Kenya and invited uh, women engineers, programmers, web developers to mentor the girls and it takes to get into the various, and what it takes to get into the various careers in computing. And we have done this for the last 10 years. And this has really had an impact. And we can see this when we walk along the corridors of the universities that we work with. A girl walks towards me and says, thank you for helping me make up my mind into doing computer science. I attended one of the career workshops that you organized. And this gives me great joy uh, to see many great women engineers from various, uh, uh, from various uh, disciplines. This gives me great joy. Thanks to the many great women engineers from the various chapters uh, of AFCHIX Africa, thanks to our great sponsors like uh, Internet Society, who have sponsored the various trainings all over Africa. 
Thanks to Steve Hutter from uh, Network Startup Resource uh, Center for the constant support in this. Though we all deal in different spheres, we have something in common. It is striving for better. And I'm glad I can say this. It is a great honor to be inducted into the Hall of Fame in the category of Global Connectors. Thank you. Now we have Mahabir Poon, connected remote villages in Nepal, Himalaya with Wi-Fi and other wireless technology. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak and thank you, I would like to thank you all for, you know, inducting me in the Hall of, Hall of Fame. I did not invent anything, I am not an innovator. And the, the only thing I did is, you know, in early 2000, you know, when the Wi-Fi was just coming, you know, I used the simple indoor router to make a long range, you know, wireless link. Uh, 40 kilometer link to bring internet in my home village. That was the starting. Uh, I did not know that time much about the technology itself. I could not have done everything without the you know help of this uh, undergraduate university students from America and Europe. Uh, it was a time you know, when it was illegal, the government had to ban, had banned to use all kind of wireless equipment and bring it into the country because of the fighting going there. So those university students, undergraduate students, they helped me to smuggle everything, <laughs> all these, you know, these small indoor routers to the country. And they helped me to, you know, build. I work as a, a team leader for them, but you know, without their help, you know, I could not have done that. We, you know, used a small indoor router and uh, built uh, our own antennas, different type of antennas, and became able to uh, build the long-range, you know, link, wireless link, and and uh, it was very surprise to most of these, you know telecommunication engineers, professionals, you know, because they thought that it would not work, uh, and, uh, but that work. So I would like to thank those friends uh, from the early days also. You know, I worked for four years from 2002 to 2006, building, you know, wireless network in the remote areas. And most of these areas, they don't have any roads and they don't have any uh, telephones, you know, electricity. I, I work illegally. I, we built the you know, network illegally and brought the internet there and I introduced it to the schools and the communities. So in 2006, I went to the, you know, member of parliaments and gave them, you know, a presentation telling them what you know, we did uh, to bring internet in the, in the remote areas. And uh, I told them how it is useful for the people in the remote areas as well. So, that's, and I asked them to legalize it. So, within a week, you know, they legalized the network and they, legalize, they, they delicensed, you know, 2.4, and uh, 5.8 gigahertz frequencies, so it's legal now. So we are using 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz to build wireless network in the remote villages where no commercial providers are going because it is not feasible, financially feasible for the commercial providers to go in the remote areas and provide it, you know, provide an internet service and bring the, the benefit of the technology for the rural people, and that's what I'm doing. And uh, I hope that this award will help me to, you know, convince the government to do more, to introduce 
the uh, technology in in the area and for the benefit of the especially for the people who are you know at the bottom of the pyramid so i am not uh, only ad advocating uh, with the government for open and a free internet i am advocating with the in uh, with the government to make you know the internet available freely also because the people cannot afford to simply cannot afford to have it so for that what i am advocating with the government is to use the universal obligation fund to provide the free internet for the people in the rural areas and bring the benefit of the technology there thank you very much Srinivasan Ramani led ERNet team at India's National Centre for Software Technology to set up Central Mail Switch and International Gateway. Yes, welcome. Thanks to the Internet Society and to the Internet Hall of Fame for having invited me here and honouring me. Um, I stand here as a representative of uh, a number of uh, groups of colleagues. Uh, the work that uh, was described uh, was a part of what I did as a part of the Indian Academic Network project called the Education and Research Network, ERDET, funded by the Government of India and supported by the United Nations Development Programme. And it was perceived, uh, you know, it was conceived in a spirit of uh, networking for development, for developing countries everywhere. There was a excitement with the idea that developing countries needed computer networking technology uh, very badly. And they had, this technology had a very special meaning for them. And the academic community could be forerunners in adopting and adapting the technology and innovating on it and making it available to industry and to business. So it was part of this large program that I worked on this. We were fortunate, we were in Mumbai where there were excellent telecom facilities and I was the director of a National Center for Software Technology as was mentioned and therefore uh, we were Unix hackers and uh, with BSD Unix uh, for which I paid a princely sum of $110 for, uh, you know, the reel came free, a reel of tape and uh, with this $110 worth of BSD uh, Unix, we were able to get a lot done, get the suite of uh, computer networking suite running and we were all set and ready for networking but the telecom links were not there. So, uh, but Mumbai had the internet, not the internet, the international gateway for telecom. So it was not too difficult for us to get good telecom connections to the world. And we connected with uh, Center Viscunde Informatic in Amsterdam. Uh, colleagues there were very kind enough to give us a connection. And we set up the first internet gateway in India. This was done by the uh, Yernet project team at the National Center for Software Technology, and uh, I, which I headed at that time. Uh, but more exciting than just the technology of getting a connection was working with six advanced institutes in India, the six uh, the IITs as we call them. Indian Institutes of Technology and uh, setting up connections between Mumbai and these six uh, IITs and working with the six senior colleagues at all these locations and with the Government of India team in Delhi and working with the UNDP. So these were exciting times and we got this work done and we were able to train hundreds of students who went on to serve the industry and consult for the industry, pass the technology on to the industry. So this is the background to the uh, work that I was uh, involved in. 
And I thank all my colleagues in these teams at the National Center for Software Technology, which is now called, which is now a part of the uh, Center for the Development of Advanced Computing, CDAC. And also I thank the colleagues of the ERNET, particularly the six professors and the six IITs who cooperated with us, who were my partners, and with the government of India. And an amazing uh, person who worked at the government of India as our uh, interface with the government, Mr. Ramachandran, Ramakrishnan. Ramakrishnan was a senior government official, but he was more of an academic at heart. And he worked with us like an academic. And uh, but for him, I think we would have done very little in the uh, Ernet project. I should also thank my wife uh, Usha, who is here, and my mother, who is 99, and who will be the proudest when I go her and show her the certificate. Occasionally, when I take an online course now and I pass the requirements. And I show her the certificate. She says, oh, get it framed. I want it on the wall here in my room. <laughs> and so at 98, I'm going to give her a framed copy of the certificate. She'll be very happy. <laughs> and with these words, I will conclude here. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Roberts, first president and CEO of ICANN. Thank you. Uh, like others, I'm very honored to be here. It's a distinguished group. Uh, I had no expectation of, of joining you. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I thank the Internet Society and I thank my nominators, express my appreciation for that. Uh, my love affair with computing, which became after a while a love affair with networking, uh, began in the middle 60s when I was a graduate student in business at Stanford. And someone said, you know, there's something going on on the west side of campus having to do with computers. And so I wandered over there and, and sort of poked around. And there was an IBM 7090 and a Burroughs B5500. And somebody said, you know, you ought to take a programming course. It might be useful. <laughs> well, it was certainly interesting. I'm not sure how useful it was. But, but those were heady days. Uh, Fortran, uh, John Bacchus was at the Almaden Lab, which was just down the road. And uh, so there was a... There was sort of something in the air about it that, that gathered me. And when I became uh, subsequently uh, involved with uh, computing at Stanford, uh, it, it just has carried forward. And ca uh, Stanford's leading position in computing uh, continues to this day and is based on, on uh, an awful lot of talent and an awful lot of energy. So I certainly owe a lot to the many people I worked with at Stanford. One of the skill sets that I have brought to my career is an appreciation for team building, which is also in the academic environment called collaboration. And interestingly enough, and I don't say this in a negative fashion, but if you analyze a little bit about uh, where did this multi-stakeholder uh, term come from, you, you won't find any of it in the early days of ICANN. When the initial board and I put ICANN together and we had a set of bylaws and we set off to chase our technical coordination uh, mission, uh, there wasn't, nobody talked about multi-stakeholders. In fact, we talked about support organizations and, and other sort of code words for trying to get people to pull together was basically what it was all about. So really, if you parse multi-stakeholderism, you can find a trail back to academic collaboration in many other. I need to be brief because uh, everybody has to have a chance to talk tonight, and mo many of you have already touched on important themes uh, in your careers that are also important in, in my career. Uh, one of the things I'd like to close with is to point out that many of us who go back a while in the Internet uh, have viewed it, our role as a nurturing role. They're, they're quite a number of people in this room that have played very prominent roles in nurturing uh, the evolution, growth, and development of the, of the Internet. What's going on right now, I think, is that we're, we need to recognize that we're moving out of an era of nurturing. 
And I don't want to be dismissive at all of the en enormous value of the efforts, the grassroots efforts that are being made around the world that are still in a nurturing stage. But for those of us who are still working in and dealing with the, the really major challenges about the future of, of the Internet, we have to recognize that we're moving in into an era of, of sustaining, sustaining the Internet. And that requires that we look a little bit down inside ourselves and, and, and ask a question about, well, how did we get here? And, and that, of course, I could talk all evening, and many of you could as well. But let me suggest to you that, that the values that are rampant in this room, the values that got us where we are, uh, still have a utility to service in the future as we hand off the stewardship roles that we have had to our to our successors in leadership. And some of these things you'll recognize as coming out of an academic and academic environment that, but, uh, and, and potentially uh, a, a nonprofit environment. Many people are concerned that the profit motive is ruining the internet. I think we have to, we have to really look at that. This, it's different strokes for different folks. We absolutely could not have the internet we have today without private investment and private enterprise. We couldn't have the internet we have today without the open uh, and free internet that we incubated on university campuses. We have, to, we have to have both. But to go back very briefly to the notion of values, uh, I've always thought as I get into the ending part and rather than the beginning part of my career that that I've been aided by the notion of a respect uh, for learning and research and scholarship. Parallel and related to that is the notion of an expectation of intellectual rigor and competence in what we do. The world today has too many people who are taking a free ride on the work of others and somehow or other getting away with not being very good at what they do. We can't afford to have any of that in the internet and in internet leadership. Thirdly, we really need the same bias for action that got us where we are. We have Eric telling us he got captured as a graduate student to do send mail. There are parallel stories in the whole room. So we, we need, we need to, to say to ourselves, you know, after you've got covered the, the learning part and the competence part, go out and use it. And, and finally, uh, we have to continue to love what we do and to have fun. Thank you. Next, we have Ben Siegel. Enable the web web's development by coordinating TCP IP's adoption within CERN. Thanks to everyone. It feels like family. Uh, I had some prepared remarks, but actually what, what Mike just said makes me feel a bit more philosophical. I want to just make a few remarks about mentors and protectors. Most of us here have needed either or both of those. So I want to talk about two people in particular without whom I wouldn't be here. The first person you know, and the second person you almost surely don't know. <coughs> the first person is Tim Berners-Lee, who, when he was being inducted two years ago in Geneva, saw me in the audience and went out of his way to recognize me as one of his mentors. This is sort of one of the high points of my career. I was very moved by that. <coughs> Tim needed protector, by the way. His protector was his manager, Mike Sandor, who was a wonderful guy. Unfortunately, no longer with us, he had leukemia. Mike was the one who wrote on Tim's first proposal, vague but exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody could foresee what was going to happen in the few years after that. That was 1989. The 
The second person who you've not heard about was my boss for around 20 years, and he protected me. He had vision, like going out of style. He could see five years ahead and knew how to get there. Why he is an unsung hero, I don't know. His name is Leslie Robertson. He finished his career at CERN recently, having also built the worldwide LHC grid, which did all the necessary computing to support the LHC experiments, which a couple of years ago, over a couple of years, discovered the Higgs boson. So without Les, I would not have had the protection necessary to introduce TCP/IP at CERN, which was a very difficult job. In among family, you know how tough it was. It started in 1984, and believe me, a lot of my blood was left on the floor for five years. We had very serious opposition, in an, uh, in an unreasonable kind. I think it's still, still, some of it still hurts. Anyway, Les, who is a great politician, when, when I have a dirty trick done to me, I, I tend not to forget that. But Les could smile, carry on with it, and people like me need people like that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm losing track now. Okay. I should also um, say, I want to thank my family, apart from the family here, I want to thank my own family who tolerated me many years. I want to thank my son Adam, who's here, who actually flew me here in his Boeing 777. <laughs> and uh, thank you again for the, the society and for the nominating committee or whatever it was that, that got me here. Thank you. Douglas Van Howling, Chairman of the Statewide Computing Network in Michigan, when the National Science Foundation awarded it responsibility for operating and managing the NSFNet national backbone. Like all of my colleagues, I'm extraordinarily honored to be with you tonight uh, to share this honor. I want to thank uh, the Internet Society and all of you who have worked together to make the Internet possible. I also want to thank you for recognizing the work of my colleagues at Merit, at Internet2, and the global higher education and research community that has given us so much of what we now know as the internet. You're really recognizing their effort as you recognize all of us here tonight. I want to say a few words about the internet, where it's, I think, going to continue to make a difference. I think of the internet going forward as really the interpersonal internet. One of the things that we have discovered over and over again as we build networks that move electrons around and photons around is that human beings use those to connect with one another. We think we're connecting computers together. It turns out we're connecting human beings together. The internet allows us to diversify our relationships, witness tonight, to deepen our affiliations, and to increase global productivity. There's now something else happening. It's the internet of things, which I believe is going to make us able to manage our planet more effectively, and to concentrate our efforts on the things that really matter, rather than spending our time holding a steering wheel and driving our car. Increasing safety and allowing us to focus on more creative 
and non-routine work. But you know, both the interpersonal internet and the internet of things offer opportunities for corporate and government intrusion into our lives, for solutions that are based primarily on private as opposed to public benefit. As we think about our future together, we need to think about the way we can create solutions both to advancing in the face of the opportunity that we're offered and also dealing with the threats that are inherent in those advances. I am personally convinced that strengthening organizations like ISOC, ICANN, IETF, the World Wide Web Consortium, the national research and education networks that have led to so much of the advance, and to the higher education and research community from which so many of us sprung, are key to seeing both those advances and dealing with the challenges. We have together led innovation and governance in the past. We must lead into the future. As Mike says, our job is to sustain the environment that we've helped create and move it forward. I look forward to working with all of you and want to thank the Internet Society for giving us all the opportunity to accomplish these very worthwhile goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next category is the Pioneers Circle recognizing individuals who were instrumental in the early design and development of the internet. First, we have Douglas Engelbart, early visionary for technological firsts, including computer mouse, display editing, hypermedia, and cross-file editing. This is a posthumous award, and his daughter, Christina Engelbart, will accept the award on his behalf. Thank you. I know we are all wishing that my father could have been here himself today. He would have been deeply honored, and I know you would all have loved him. Uh, as his daughter and also his longtime business partner, I feel so grateful for the opportunity to be accepting this award on his behalf. Although many may not recognize his name, most people today are very fam familiar with the foundational technology that Doug Engelbart pioneered beginning in the 1960s. From hypertext to video teleconferencing, from the friendly computer mouse to graphical user interface, from new media to knowledge management, online communities, digital libraries, and much, much more. By 1968, he and his team staged the first public demonstration of their work, which is now famously known as the mother of all demos. The funding for his research came from Bob Taylor, Hall of Famer Bob Taylor, at ARPA, who had been cooking up a plan to network all the, computers, all the computer labs he was funding. When Bob announced his plan to the principal investigators, Doug Engelbart was one of the first to line up because it dovetailed so beautifully with his own research. So in 1969, when Len Kleinrock's lab at UCLA was the first site on the ARPANET, Doug Engelbart's lab at SRI was the second. UCLA had the additional task of running the Network Measurement Center to monitor ARPANET performance, and Doug Engelbart's group ran a Network Information Center to serve and facilitate the ARPANET community. Jake Feinler and John Postel got their start in Doug's lab. His chief architect, Jeff Rulison, was a founding member of Steve Crocker's Network Working Group. Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn were, at one point, both users of Doug's collaborative hypermedia system. His accomplishments spanned many disciplines, but it all stemmed from a single research agenda in which he recognized a crucial need for humanity to get smarter and smarter at solving important problems collectively, especially in the face of accelerated change, which he anticipated beginning in 1960. 
The single-minded pursuit, which he called augmenting the human intellect and later boosting our collective IQ, he saw not only as the greatest opportunity on the planet for unleashing our true potential as a human race, but our single greatest imperative as well. And here today, 40 years later, we have only still scratched the surface of this important research agenda. So to further honor his memory and all that he worked for, I encourage you, the innovators, the global connectors, the pioneers, the internet society, to consider this important challenge, which is more relevant and pressing today than ever. You can find his archives and his call to action on the Doug Engelbart Institute website, and please do keep in touch. I'd like to thank the Internet Society, and I know my father would like to thank also uh, his team because it always takes a collective effort to, to get all of these things moving. And then he always uh, liked to thank his family, so I'll do that, <laughs> for putting up with him all these years. So thank you very much. Next, we have Susan Estrada, founded SurfNet, one of the original regional IP networks that serve the academic and commercial communities in California. Thank you <clears throat> to the Internet Society for this wonderful honor today. I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time. In 1985 and 86, I installed a really darn fast 56 kilobit per second wide area network for the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Then after that, thanks to Dennis Jennings, my fellow pioneer today, uh, I was involved with installing the first NSF connections between the, the, uh, the centers that were whopping 1.5 megabits per second and vendors told me at that time that nobody had that much data. <laughs> the natural next step in 1987 was to create an internet service provider called the California Education and Research Federation Network, also known as SurfNet, because those darn people in the Netherlands took the real surf from us in California. <laughs> My team developed a number of notable firsts for the internet, including the first deployment of dial-up IP. Sounds so 1982, doesn't it? Um, accounting reports for customers, and we had, were the first network to offer 24-hour, seven-day-a-week monitoring of the network. One of our earliest commercial customers was a small startup named Qualcomm. And we made some bold choices like purchasing equipment from another small startup named Cisco and provided them with a big boost. We were 10% of their gross revenue for 1988 and they didn't know how to fulfill our order. <laughs> and working with PSINet and UUNet, we formed the interconnection enabling the first commercial internet traffic via the commercial internet exchange also known as the Kicks. This accomplishment, which seems so logical now, was a very radical idea at the time, and there was a lot of brick throwing going on. My team and I spent a lot of time as well devising ways to broaden the use of the internet. We brought teachers and librarians online. We created Captain Internet, a female cartoon character, to humanize the internet and to encourage regular people to use the internet. Today, I still spend time devising strategies to get the underserved online. In particular, I've been working to broaden the use of internet by older adults, those 65 and older, because the internet is increasingly important to successful aging and its core elements, socializing, learning, and being able to contribute to the greater good. I would also like to thank my husband, Don, as well as my digital native children, Chris and Megan, who teach me every day new and interesting ways to use the internet because it is the great collaboratory. Working and collaborating together, we can continue to make Captain Internet's vision come true. Another victory for truth, connectedness, and the internet way. Thank you very much for this honor. Now we have Frank Hart, 
who led a small group at Bolt Baranek and Newman that won a contract to build the interface message processor for an expandable four-node ARPANET. Frank was unable to attend, but accepting on his behalf is Bob Hinden, Chair of the Internet Society Board of Trustees. Yeah, I'm, I'm very honored to uh, be able to accept this for Frank. We uh, talked on the phone last week, so he, he asked me to say a few things. Um, the first was, I think someone mentioned sort of being at the right place at the right time. So he said he, he, he was, he, that happened to him twice, first to work on the Whirlwind computer project, you know, in the early days of computing, and then later on the ARPANET. So it's, he had a very uh, remarkable career. Um, he said that the, um, the thing he most re remembers about the building the, the early ARPANET um, was it was really an amazing effort by a few people. Um, you know, it, it shows what can happen when you put together a very talented group of focused people and they can really accomplish an amazing amount of things. Because this was not some giant project, this was a really small focused project. And they did so many, I think, remarkable things that sort of built the base of what, you know, many of the technologies like routing that really led to what we still use today um, in the internet. So um, he wanted to, for me to thank you for the hall, his Hall of Fame induction, and he accepts this on behalf of the team who built the original ARPANET. Thank you. Next, we have Dennis Jennings as the first program director for networking at the U.S. National Science Foundation. He was responsible for the design and development of the National Science Foundation Network. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm delighted and really honored to be here. But before I tell you a bit about the past, let me tell you a bit about today. It's some very interesting and exciting new news. Last week, the, U the uh, European Parliament passed an act enforcing net neutrality. And that's a major step. It's now up to the government, so we need to lobby the governments to make sure that they're not lobbied by the telecoms industry to undermine this step. And this morning, the, court, the European Court of Justice t overturned the Data Retention Act, the directive in Europe, citing that, yes, citing that the, the uh, security does not trump personal privacy, and this whole directive has to be written, rewritten, and I thought we have a job to do to make sure that that's rewritten properly. Now, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, I think this is important, but anyway, back to the past, 20, 29 years ago, I was invited, I was involved in networking in the decade of the 80s, and I was invited to join the National Science Foundation as the first program director for networking. I started on the 1st of January 1985, and I was on 15 months leave of absence from University College Dublin. So I had this window of opportunity to do something. Now, I was hired to build a supercomputer access network, or a set of networks for supercomputer access. The reason I took the job was that I saw an opportunity to do something much bigger in that. So with the benefit of hindsight, I'll now express what I did in sort of the terms I would use nowadays. I'm, I'm no longer involved. I'm, I'm a venture capitalist, an angel investor, that sort of stuff. So what I think I did was I took a long-term strategic approach to building uh, the, the network rather than a short-term tactical view. And that meant supporting the longer-term needs of all researchers in the United States at their desktops, rather than only the supercomputer users access supercomputers. That meant building a scalable network of networks, an internet, based on campus, regional, community, backbone networks, rather than a set of dedicated supercomputer access networks. And two of those had already been funded by the time I joined. This meant changing the way the NSF itself approached the work I was trying to do. Normally, the NSF uh, program directors sit and wait for interesting proposals. 
the approach I took was to define the mission, indeed to define the technology. It had to be an internet, it had to be TCP IP, to mandate that TCP IP would be used, in some cases in due course, and inviting proposals to fill up those components of the network of the networks. This meant leveraging NSF funds by involving the research community and providing seed funding to enable those communities to build their own networks and spend their own money doing so, rather than seeking a, a single contractor to build a network, although later on for the high-speed backbone that proved to be the best way of doing it. And that meant my, my role was to provide leadership. To go out and I spent the 15 months going around the United States talking to people and it, trying to excite people about the research network and about participating and contributing to this effort. And to find a way to accommodate the short-term battles, and they were intense, between the strategic view and the tactical view. And I had many public battles when people pointed out that I was undermining the health of US research by going for a long-term uh, strategic view for a technology that didn't work very well the TCP IP internet technology, rather than the short-term tactical you know, MFE net or, or, or DEC net, which worked very well indeed. And that's why I think the NSF net program was successful. My work was based on the vision and enthusiasm of many people who went before me. And indeed by the people who followed. In particular, I want the only person I'm going to mention my name is Steve Wolf, who took up the, the, the work and turned it into the NSF net and the internet we have today. But most importantly, my work was supported by the dozens, perhaps even hundreds of people, some of whom you've already recognized in the Internet of Hall of Fame, some of whom are recognized today, who took up the challenge. These were research leaders, researchers, networkers. They took up the challenge. They put their own time and effort in, and they made the NSF Net program work. So it's on their behalf all those people who actually did the hard work, that I'm very honoured to be here to accept this award, and I thank you. Rolf Nordhagen, leading role in the development of the Norwegian Academic Network Uninet and the Nordic University Network Nordinet. This is a posthumous award, and his wife Annalisa will accept on his behalf. First of all, thank you to the committee for inviting me. On behalf of the whole family, I would like to thank the ISO for honoring my late husband, Rolf Norway, in particip <coughs> participating in the history of the internet. He would have been so proud to be re recognized in this way. Being part of the community that pioneered the, de and the developing and proliferation of the internet was very much his life's most significant project. Very early, he envisioned the great improvement it would have on the academic exchange of knowledge, ideas, and discourse. That it would ultimately connect and empower people all over the globe for social, commercial, and political purposes was as astonishing to him as it probably is to most of us. It's quite in character that he, only days before he passed away in the retirement home, posted a long message on Facebook where he demanded that the municipality of Oslo develop a better system for logging onto the public Wi-Fi system. <laughs> in fact, I'm quite sure he has already been pestering St. Peter about getting internet in the real clouds. <laughs> he has not succeeded yet, though, because then he would have been on the screen right here thanking you all over the Skype.
Radia Palman designed a protocol in the 1980s that continues to flourish for routing IP today. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this honor. Um, I would like to say that, um, you know, I was born knowing I was going to be designing protocols. Um, but in fact, um, if um, I'd known more about computers when I was young, I would have said I would be happy doing pretty much anything as long as it didn't involve computers. <laughs> and I think that the fact that I really am not in love with computers means that um, I design things for people like myself. I want things to just work, and you shouldn't have to understand it. Too much uh, of the time, engineers design for other engineers, and they ask you questions like, do you want to display both the secure and the insecure items, um, which I happen to know what it means that it's nonsensical. And um, you know, things just shouldn't be that way. Um, so I um, you know, very much believe that networks should be completely self-organizing. And then um, I was actually pressured, you know, people told me, well, some of our customers really enjoy configuring things. Well, okay, fine, you want to configure things? So I put in knobs that you could play with, um, but you don't have to touch the knobs. It'll work without your touching the knobs. And if you want to play with the knobs, fine, any setting of the knobs will still work. So <laughs> I believe things should be like incredibly easy to use because it's actually people um, running it. Um, the other thing is that we put up with just junk. We, we come to believe that it's, um, of course, natural that your computer will freeze every few days and you have to reboot it. That might be fine for a computer. It's not OK for the internet. There's no on-off switch for the internet. So the internet has to be absolutely robust. And so that was one of the other things um, that I did that I, um, before I, I mean, one, one of the pieces of work that I did was to make um, the, the routing of networks uh, what's called self-stabilizing, which um, before that it was possible that even though all of the um, routers were doing the right algorithm, if some history of kind of bad packets or one sick router um, um, would be emitted, the whole network would be down forever, even though the sick router that injected it would be removed. So that's really important for it not to work that way. Um, and interestingly, in the paper in which I explained how the existing stuff would not, uh, you know, could get into this bad state and how to design it so that it would be self-stabilizing. The last line I um, wrote in that paper was, well, um, you know, this is how to make it work. Once you get rid of the bad guy, um, um, the network will return to normal operation. Well, when I went back to graduate school um, 10 years later, um, my manager at Digital, uh, Tony Locke, um, suggested that for my thesis, I either prove my statement in this paper that you couldn't possibly expect a network to work while the bad guy was still there, um, or figure out how to do it. And so my thesis was actually, you know, even extending robustness to having a distributed algorithm or, or a network work even when some of the participants are malicious. So uh, while they're still connected. And the bigger the internet is, we have to realize that there will sometimes be malicious participants. So, um, you know, whenever there's information, a lot of it is going to be wrong and maliciously placed. And how can society still work? How can, how can the network still work? So um, the internet has so many amazing challenges ahead. The basic technology of sort of getting it working um, is almost dwarfed by the challenges there are ahead of us. So um, 
it's wonderful that anybody can say anything and um, disseminate it to the whole world. But then, how do you distinguish correct information from incorrect information? If there's nobody um, sort of being able to tell you what's true and what's not true, it's almost like, why bother looking it up? Just make up something. Um, the right stuff will be there, but a hundred times as much wrong stuff will be there. Um, and so that, that's a real um, danger. The other thing is, um, you know, again, people don't like censorship, but what about genuinely dangerous things um, telling you how to um, create horrible poisons or bombs or so forth? Do you really want there to be no censorship and to have information like that be um, readily available? Um, the other thing is that information should be free. It's sort of so wonderful that, um, you know, some very poor villager somewhere can access these things, teach themselves whatever. But on the other hand, if information is free, um, so many newspapers and magazines are now out of business. Um, somebody, it, it costs a lot of money to actually do investigative journalism. And so if we expect this stuff to be free, where will the information come from? Because uh, somebody has to do that. Um, the challenge of having all of these diverse cultures cooperating together in the same internet in terms of what should the rules be, what should be allowed to be uh, displayed is, um, you know, amazingly difficult challenges. But um, it is astonishing that the internet works as well as it does today and has scaled as well as it um, does. But it's certainly a fascinating time to be, um, to be part of it. So thank you. A big congratulations to all of the inductees. This now concludes our ceremony.